Kaip? Mes... Aš taip ir žinoma. Anatolijas. Sveikas, Anatolijas. Labą dieną. Labas, Anatolijas. Kada galima? Labą dieną. Džiaugiuosi, kad šiandien... Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for meeting especially those people who really care about the freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Today in Lithuania we celebrate the restoration of freedom and, and here we are in a very special hall of the same as, uh, because uh, this hall reminds us the main freedoms uh, and human rights. Today it is a great day to speak about uh, the freedoms of our neighbors and friends in Belarus uh, and their ability to use and enjoy the same rights. Today we discuss the threat of authoritarianism for the freedom of speech and expression in the case of Belarus today. This is a joint uh, uh, conference of the same as of the European Parliament and the Lithuanian Journalist Union. Uh, three languages are available. Use the opportunity to do that uh, through your Zoom platform. Today we have uh, representatives uh, in person and also those connected online. I'm Actually, the moderator of the conference. And first of all, I would like to give the floor to the leaders that are in front of our topic and other topics. Both the speaker of the same as the Republic of Lithuania and the leader of Democratic Belarus constantly speak about the freedom of speech and freedom of expression of all the people. Therefore, I give the floor to Victoria Chmilita Nielsen, speak of the same as the Republic of Lithuania. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We started this week with the World Press Freedom Day. It is symbolic that today, on the day of the restoration of the Lithuanian press, language and book, we participate in an international conference on the threat to self-expression and freedom of expression in Belarus. I say symbolic because the Lithuanian nation, more than 100 years ago, itself experienced what it means banning press, free speech and censorship. As early as 1948, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights affirmed that everyone had the right to freely observe and express his or her beliefs, and this right should include the freedom to have an unhindered opinion and so to seek, receive and disseminate information and ideas by any means and regardless of State borders. Since then, 17 years later, we have many more ways to spread information and to express our opinion. However, we know that even today, the free speech of citizens is being restricted or censored, and that the media that publish it often receive attacks and repression. On the other hand, the pandemic has seen an increase in the spread of disinformation, misleading and false news that disbalances and divides society, undermines democratic principles and ultimately affects citizens' health. The attention of the international community should therefore be focused on combating disinformation misleading and illegal content, interference with the free right of expression and getting correct information. I sincerely wish that the tools of this fight be found at this conference dedicated to the World Press Freedom Day. I am looking forward to meaningful and productive conference. Thank you. I thank the speaker of the same as, uh, while this is a very, this is a great introduction, but we have to have two introductions. Uh, therefore, I'd like to give the floor to Svetlana Tsikhanovska, the leader of the Belarusian opposition. Free, free. She has not uh, yet uh, online. She hasn't joined us. Svetlana. Are you in the room? Okay. 
She is connecting while the conference is uh, still continuing. Mr. Hanovska has joined us, and therefore I would like to give the floor to Svetlana Tsikhanovska to make the introductory remarks. Uh, Madam Tsikhanovska, could you please switch on your microphone oh. and your camera? Okay, this Svetlana, can you... Do you see me? Yes, perfect, thank you, welcome. Finally. Please, the skin is yours, really. Thank you. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Thank you for the possibility to speak before you today. It's precisely one year ago on May 7, 2020, that my husband, Sergei Tikhanovsky, announced his decision to run for president of Belarus. He wasn't affiliated to any political party or structure. He only had his independent work in YouTube. The videos where Sergei interviewed Belarusians about their everyday problems happened to have a tremendous mobilizing effect. Thousands of citizens across the country saw that they are not alone and joined the movement to support Sergei and later me. And during the last year, our movement has completely changed Belarus and Belarusians, and it's not going to stop until the decisive victory of democracy. This story proves the strength of the media. They are more than just the source of information. The media and change the society itself. At some point, Belarusians started to prefer the and professional independent media to the centralized state propaganda. When the regime finally understood it, the only thing it could do was to get revenge on the independent journalists. Belarus has become the most dangerous country in Europe for journalists, where they can be fined, arrested, beaten, or even shot for doing their job. Repressive laws are introduced to legalize this professional ban. But this has only led to the greater demand for independent information among Belarusians, and the prosecuted journalists are already treated as heroes. I especially mean such political prisoners as Igor Losik, Mikola Didok, Katerina Andreeva, Dari Chultsova, Katerina Borisevich, and others who defy the regime even being in jail. The journalists of such media as Tutbay, Nasha Niva, Bill Saad, Radio Svoboda, and others continue working despite the conditions and without compromising quality. Meanwhile, the grassroots media infrastructure continues to develop, especially the network of telegram channels. And there is even the return of some is that with dozens of self-made newspapers across the country. The Belarusian society supports the independent media, but they also need support from the international community. I invite us all to discuss what can be done for that, putting this issue in the broader context of the defense of human rights and keeping in mind the perspective of the future development of Belarus. I hope that today we can have a fruitful exchange on those matters. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you. And once again, uh, we need to start uh, our conference with very important topics. And I will switch to Lithuanian, but please don't forget, we have three languages today. Ruski, English, and Lietuviškai. Well, my work is rather simple here today to moderate the conference, and now we are going to have the session entitled The Human Rights in Belarus, Challenges and Solutions, which is extremely important indeed. Petras Doštrevičius is my colleague, and I think he is a good one. Old acquaintance and friend who clearly understand that politicians and journalists have extremely important job today. So I invite Mr. Patras to moderate as a 
politician and be honest as a journalist. Thank you, Danius. Thank you for, for your trust and your wishes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really happy to start the first session of our conference here today. And the fact that this conference is organized together with Dela Sanavichute, member of the Lithuanian Seimas, and also the Lithuanian Journalists' Union, shows that Lithuania is a democratic country. We are talking with journalists, with the ones who analyze the situation and criticize, and uh, I am happy that we can work together very closely when we need to fight for defense of human rights, especially in the places where they are not respected. In the course of 27 years, Alexander Lukashenko managed not only to create a repressive system, but also to make us get used to human rights violations in Belarus. It seems as if nothing new is happening. However, what we see in the course of last nine or ten months is shocking, because we see a new wave of the violation of basic human rights and freedoms and saying that the situation is developing from bad to worse would not be an exaggeration. One thing is very important here. In the elimination of inviolability so that everyone who commits crimes against human rights in Belarus should feel free and uh, do not face any threat of legitimate actions. I really have the pleasure to give the floor to Zygimantas Pavilonis, member of the Seimas, head of the Committee on Foreign Affairs of the Seimas of the Republic of Lithuania, the person who is the initiator of the Kalinovsky Conference, a very important and interesting event. And uh, I invite Mr. Zygimantas Pavilonis asking to keep to seven minutes time frame, if you can. Zygimantas, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Patras, Darius, Dala, friends, the ones who are not here with us in the hall, but who are observing this conference remotely. We have been meeting and discussing it for several times already, and I agree with Patras and Dala that we just must to continue our discussions, especially now, when the repressions in Belarus have reached such a level that people feel intimidated and uh, fear to fight for their rights. Politicians, unfortunately, tend to react to major events. And if we don't see them now, it's because of the repressions, the level of repressions. And it is namely today when everyone's attention is mainly focused on Ukraine, we just must to stop the silence, to break the silence. And speaking on the positive note, our activities have led to some political results. As mentioned before during the press conference, today we are not acting alone as it used to be in the past, talking about Belarusian freedom. The whole democratic world is with us today. The principles that we have been repeating here belong to everyone now. So on the political level, we do have a coalition, and we, I'm speaking about powerful states, countries that have a lot of political tools for forcing Lukashenko or even Putin to step away and not to hurt people. However, very strong political will is required and we must do, must take actions. The fourth package of sanctions must be introduced. We see that Lukashenko is afraid of that, of that package. He is trying to threaten with statements about shutting down all foreign companies, Western companies, 
and do other things. And we see that he is afraid. This is why we should apply this. I believe that foreign ministers come back from Brussels with the new positive news that the decisions are going to be taken shortly. However, we who are here in Vilnius, who have always been supporting this fight for freedom on all levels, should do everything to make these words shift into deeds. It's a good thing that the U.S. ambassador is going to reside in Vilnius now. We are looking forward to her return. We very much hope that uh, Chancellor Merkel will be with us and that we will all stand together with Washington, with Vilnius. I also believe that the Swedish democracy, who have been supporting us so much in our fight, who are uh, presiding over the OSCE now, will have determination to open one more historical page Similarly to what OSCE did trying to with, uh, withdraw, make Russia to withdraw its army from Lithuania, so that we will have democratic new elections in Belarus. I hope that President Biden, when meeting with Putin, in June, we'll speak not about Ukraine only, but also about Belarus. So that Putin understands that he may face the risk, a big threat. The measures have been already named in the Senate, in the U.S. Congress, with respect not to high-level officials, but also the huge companies, banks. We can do it, and we must do it, in my view. Therefore, let me ask everyone who have all the leverages come together and not allow the freedom to be quenched, because it's going to be our common responsibility if this happens. Thank you. I thank you, Mr. Pavilonis, and thank you for reminding us that we are collectively responsible because we are all signatories to the conventions. It is not us who must uphold those conventions, but we have to hold others responsible for upholding these conventions. It is. Uh, a pleasure for me to give the floor to Mr. Rasto Kujal, who is an expert of uh, media and elections. He has more than 20 years experience. Since 1998, uh, Mr. Kujal has been uh, heading the uh, NGO Memo 98. This is uh, Memo 98 is organization helps people to get uh, truthful information about public policy and aims at uh, giving accurate information to people in order to strengthen their critical thinking. Mr. Kuchel, the floor is yours for seven minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Can you just confirm that you can hear me? Yes, we can. Is it? Very good, very good. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my honor uh, to participate in uh, today's event. As it was already mentioned, I'm a media and election expert who has spent the uh, last two decades uh, focusing on human rights particularly in the context of elections in a number of countries, including Belarus. In fact, uh, Belarus was my first foreign country where I worked back in 1998 uh, with the, the Belarusian Association of Journalists and other organizations. And uh, so it's great to see Andre here and looking forward to hearing also from him. 
a little bit later. Since uh, 1999, I have worked uh, intensively with the Office uh, for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, observing elections in a number of uh, countries of the OSC region. It is with this background that I was asked uh, to share my insights on the historical assessment on how human rights and freedoms changed, specifically looking at the freedom of expression before and after elections. I reviewed all audio reports on Belarus uh, since uh, 2001, as they serve as a very good source when it comes to providing any historical assessment of the human rights situation prior to elections. Moreover, it is obviously important to mention the crucial work done by Human Rights Center, Vyasna, Belarusian Association of Journalists, Belarusian Press Club, and many other local organizations. Following the last year's elections in Belarus, 17 OSC participating states invoked the Moscow mechanism with regard to credible reports of human rights violations before, during, and after the election, in results of which OSC rapporteur Professor Wolfgang Benedek was tasked to analyze the situation and produced an excellent report which includes important recommendations to the Republic of Belarus, to the OSC, and to the international community. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing from him as well. Due to the limited time, I will focus only on some challenges and offer some possible solutions. It is important to say that in a number of authoritarian countries, the concept of elections as a genuine competition is absent, as they are taken as a tool to confirm the existing form of governance, giving it some clout of international legitimacy. Suppressing such genuine competition, there is an overall disregard for fundamental freedoms of assembly, association, and expression. All these fundamental freedoms deteriorate prior and after elections when it comes to freedom of expression. This means that a genuine debate is absent in the media and attempts to simulate it are done, for example, in the form of free allocation, um, free airtime allocation by state media. But even this free airtime or space has been censored and edited to prevent the direct criticism of incumbents. Any attempt by media to provide independent views and opinions on the performance of incumbents are punished or restricted. The historical overview shows that such actions were first focused on traditional media, such as television, radio, or print. And more recently, as we saw it also in uh, the last year's elections, on the so-called new media, such as internet or social media. Such punishment or restrictions include physical and psychological intimidation and harassment. On the other side, state media in particular provide massive institutional coverage of incumbents, highlighting achievements and successes. For example, during the last year's elections, Lukashenko again used the state TV to, write, to portray himself as a hardworking president taking care of the needs of the people while unnamed opponents were distracting him from running of the country. Elections are coming and going, but everyone wants to eat. Elections are secondary while the bread is always necessary, he said. In 2010, for the first time in Belarus, there were two debates which gave candidates the opportunity to address the electorate directly. Free airtime was provided in an uncensored format, although it was limited in scope and time. It should be mentioned, however, that Lukashenko did not take part in these debates, sending his representatives instead. In 2012, the ODIR final report concluded that although the Constitution guarantees freedom of expression, and prohibit censorship, candidates who called for an election boycott had their free airtime denied or censored. In 2015, 16, and 19, elections saw repetition of the about-mentioned problems with media coverage of the campaign not enabling voters 
to receive sufficient information about contestants. Last year, we saw a new low when ODIR was not able to deploy an observation mission for the first time in 20 years, in result of which there was no credible international in-country observation. When it comes to possible solutions, one has to be realistic uh, and recognize that they very much depend on the situation on the ground. As such, I'm not going to focus now on the systematic changes which are necessary when it comes to state media reforms, media regulation, and legislation. In this respect, the mentioned OD reports, as well as the reports by previously mentioned local organizations, provide a very good baseline. I will focus more on a few recommendations for international community, which I believe are essential. I believe it is important for the international community to continue insisting on new presidential election under international monitoring and to provide technical assistance for the preparation as reiterated by G7 meeting of foreign uh, ministers in London the day before yesterday. It is also important to provide assistance to journalists and others who had to leave the country. But most importantly, and I conclude here, it is vital to continue providing support to human rights defenders and civil society organizations promoting and protecting human rights on the ground. I will stop here, but very happy to take any questions or explain any points later. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Kasto Kujel. We will have certainly questions later. And now we give the floor to Mr. Vitas Sirkonis, a well-known expert in Lithuania. However, while introducing him, I would like to mention that he is the director of Freedom House Projects the lecturer of uh, Vilnius University, international science politician. So, Vidis, please, seven minutes about the wide region, if you can. Thank you. Indeed, Freedom House has released several annual reports this year seeking to assess the situation uh, of freedom and democracy in the world. And I have to state that Belarus, both in the Freedom and the World report, as well as another report that measures the level of democracy in our region, the grace of democracy have dropped significantly indeed. As a matter of fact, the situation in Belarus has been quite uh, in a bad situation for several years. It has been an authoritarian country, but now it started resembling some Central Asian country situation because of the brutal control of its citizens, of the journalists today. And even though one year ago we thought it has reached the bottom, I see that it's not the end yet, and uh, in our assessment scale, it has reached uh, respectively 5 and 11 point levels which is really very impressive in the negative sense. I already offered during the Kalinovsky conference a formula which relates to elections, accountability, partnership for transition formula. Even in Lithuania, when we speak about the Eastern Partnership, so elections and partnership is coded there also. There were 
some solutions adopted, even though Belarusians may believe that what Europe is doing is not enough, and we probably agree with that. However, on the other hand, we have to also acknowledge that the attention, the focus is quite big. Professor Wolf and Benedict uh, stated that uh, in the Belarusian case, the solutions were taken in record uh, at a record speed, which means that sometimes we can act in a determined manner. An important mechanism has been also uh, established in terms of dignity platform. There is also Anais Maham, a special reporter on the issues of human rights, who is acting here in Vilnius. On the initiative of our parliamentarians, we have the Justice House. This is why accountability mechanism is really pushed forward. However, uh, in the view of the scale of repressions, we have to act faster and to, to defend Belarusian citizens, because tens of thousands of people who have been detained, who have been made to flee their country, they cannot be happy just with our solidarity and or recommendations. They are waiting for concrete steps and the implementation of the recommendations. So what we can do is the pressure on the regime in every possible way through international platforms, be it OSCE, the United Nations, or any other. The Belarus is not the European uh, community member, but nevertheless we can speak to international law experts and find ways to force the representatives of the Belarusian regime to take accountability for the repressions. Lithuania and Germany, as well as some other countries, are trying to apply the universal jurisdiction mechanism, which is of key importance in putting an end to inviolability that is flourishing in Belarus today. So the pressure on the regime also requires targeted sanctions, sanctions on the regime itself, sanctions on those who are the main actors of the regime, as well as monetary sanctions, who are financing the repressions uh, by using smuggling of cigarettes and other things. We have to do this not only because we support the determination of uh, Belarusian people, but also because those people are also active in our our countries, Lithuania, Poland, and elsewhere. Another important point is the support to civil society, including the financial moral support. However, another big commitment that we have been discussing uh, largely a Marshall Plan for Belarus, because we understand very well that the Kremlin is the key actor there, and the Belarusian economy is hugely uh, dependent on those huge subsidies. The time will come when we will have to ensure that that narrow wind of opportunities will be opened. And then we should be ready to help to implement all the reforms, field of energy, economy, e-governance, including Poland and Estonia. We do have capabilities, and we just need very important decisions here and now, instead of just observing how the situation may evolve. We have to give this message to Belarusian people as well,
because hundreds of thousands of people who have stormed into the streets understand very well that they are risking a lot and they should see their goal, main goal, and perceive that what they are seeking is a realistic thing. And when the time comes, all the European states and community is going to support them. We have to send them this message. I thank Vitas, and now I give the floor to Professor Vorgen Benedek, those who read the report by a professor initiated by the OEC can see that Professor is highly qualified in his profession. I will remind you that Professor is uh, Europos žmogaus teisių ir demokratijos mokymo ir tyrimo centro įkūrėjas ir vienas iš jo direktorių. One of the directors and founder of the human rights law in Graz University in Austria. So the floor is yours, Professor. Those who listen to you really appreciate and therefore we are looking for your presentation. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to thank uh, for the invitation uh, to this important conference taking place on such a historic day for Lithuania. On 17 September 2020, the Moscow mechanism of the human dimension of OEC was invoked by 17 participating states with regard to credible reports of human rights violations before, during, and after the presidential elections of 9 August 2020 in the Republic of Belarus. My mandate as rapporteur was defined as to establish the facts and to give advice on possible solutions to the questions raised, which were defined as intimidation and persecution of political activists, candidates, journalists, media actors, lawyers, labor activists, and human rights defenders, as well as the detention of prospective candidates, election fraud, restriction on access to information, including internet shutdowns, excessive use of force against peaceful protesters, arbitrary and unlawful arrests or detentions, beatings, sexual and gender violence, abductions and enforced disappearances, torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, and widespread impunity for all of the above. One chapter of the report was devoted to freedom of expression and the media, as well as the right of access to information. Here, the freedom of expression and information in Belarus is being analyzed with a focus on the presidential elections of 9 August 2020 and the events thereafter. This includes also the online dimension of the freedom and for this purpose, the access to the internet. Specific attention is put on the right to safety of journalists. Regarding freedom of expression and information in the context of the elections, the report found excessively restrictive rules on accreditation already pointed out by the United Nations and by the OSC for a long time. For example, in the context of elections, the authorities did deprive at least 19 journalists of accreditation, whereas some 50 foreign journalists were denied accreditation or deported. Several popular bloggers were prosecuted under the criminal code in particular Article 342 during the election campaign. Among them, Sergei Tikhanovsky. Also, after the elections, critical bloggers faced persecution. In protest to the rigged elections, a number of public media workers resigned or stopped working, facing personal consequences. Regarding the right of access to information, including the problem of internet shutdowns, the existing obligation under the United Nations and OEC commitments 
not to disrupt access to or dissemination of information online have been systematically ignored. For example, amendments of the law on the mass media introduced on 14 June 2018 to regulate national and foreign media, as well as providing the Minister of Information with strict control over online resources, were denounced by the OSC representative on the freedom of the media as excessive and disproportionate. My report observed that there was a complete blackout of the internet in the 9th of 9 to 12 September 2020 on landlines and on also on mobile phones, while later there were short-term interruptions of service. However, during the protests on the following weekends, mobile internet was restricted outside of houses at specific locations for certain times related to the protests. Mobile internet service providers had to respond to the requests from authorized state bodies. In addition, access to some 70 websites was restricted inside Belarus with both harmful societal and economic consequences. Both situations exist until today. For example, the very informative website of human rights NGO Viasna, Spring 96.org, which I frequently used for my report, was blocked in Belarus since the election protests, while it is like other blocked websites freely accessible from the outside. As another example, the Ministry of Information of Belarus suspended the status of a mass media of one of the most popular internet news portals, which is TUTBI. The Committee to Protect Journalists lists Belarus among the 10 most censored countries worldwide. According to the World Press Freedom Index, maintained by Reporters Without Borders, Belarus presently ranks 153 out of 180 countries. The US NGO Freedom House categorizes the internet in Belarus as not free because of obstacles to access, limits on content and violations of user rights. The blockades of the internet also prevent people to meet online and thus violate the freedom of assembly online as part of the freedom of assembly. The recent draft law passed by the Belarusian parliament will further aggravate the restrictions and facilitate censorship even further. However, the constitution of Belarus in Article 33 guarantees the freedom of expression and specifically states that no censorship shall be permitted. Regarding the safety of journalists, the OSC Ministerial Council in 2018 with the consent of Belarus, adopted an important decision according to which political leaders and authorities have to refrain from intimidating, threatening, or condoning violence against journalists, since serious violations of the commitments contained in these commonly adopted standards could be observed. Already during the election process, there were many reports on violations and harassment of media workers. When they covered the protests, many were attacked and detained. Individual citizens documenting police brutality with photos or videos, so-called citizen journalists, were arrested and sentenced to several days of detention, if not more. The Association of Belarusian Journalists keeps a list of all journalists arrested and will inform about recent figures. It has produced detailed reports which I also used for my investigation. In any case, allegations according to which journalists doing their work are sanctioned for reporting about demonstrations have been found confirmed, which constitutes a major violation of the rights of journalists who have a right to report on the events. Journalists were beaten and detained like protesters. In spite of pointing out press status, they ended up in detention and suffered serious ill treatment. The police arbitrarily destroyed part of the footage and threatened to destroy also the equipment. With regard to foreign journalists, there are special sanctions 
like deprivation of accreditation and deportation in combination with a ban from re-entering Belarus. Accordingly, several media were not allowed to report on the elections from Belarus. As a result to the EU sanctions, President Lukashenko announced to withdraw all accreditations of foreign journalists. If they work without accreditation, the authorities can deport them with a ban on re-entry. In addition, local collaborators are prohibited to work for foreign media, which do not have accreditation. Otherwise, they risk high fines. Having found major violations of the freedom of expression and information, as well as of the safety of journalists, as requested by my mandate, I have made several recommendations to the government how to address the situation described. In particular, I recommend it to ensure the safety of all journalists and refrain from any persecution related to the performance of their duties, seizure of and damage to equipment and footage, to facilitate and deregulate the accreditation of foreign journalists, to refrain from interference with the access to the internet, including the mobile one, and terminate censorship and blocking of web pages as well as any restrictions on bloggers, to de-restrict the some 70 web pages blocked at a time, to end the obligation of all media outlets to keep records of and disclose to authorities the names of people who submit comments as well as the criminal liability of owners of registered online media for any content on their website. Obviously, many other recommendations like those on fair trial or against impunity do also apply. I'm glad to see that the issue of freedom of expression and media freedom in Belarus has gained much international attention, like the ARIA Formula meeting of the Security Council of the United Nations in January 2021, organized by Estonia and supported by Lithuania. I hope that the formation of an international media freedom coalition or the awards given to the Belarusian Association of Journalists and the events of today will in the end have a positive effect on the situation of freedom of expression in Belarus. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much for your extremely interesting insights and your presentations. Now we just have a few minutes and then I would like to ask you to formulate very short answers, maybe one and a half minutes if you can. I would like to start from Professor Benedek. Your presentation, in particular the conclusions, I believe all the participants of this conference could sign them because they are really correct. What was the formal institutional reaction of the Belarusian authorities to your statement? And what can we expect from OECE in the future in terms of institutional activities so that your recommendations are implemented or considered at least? Professor, if you can. Thank you very much for this question. I think you are all aware that the Belarusian government decided not to cooperate on my mission and therefore uh, they also refused to give any official response uh, to my recommendations. However, there were several international uh, meetings in the United Nations, uh, they already mentioned Security Council meeting and so on, where Belarusian uh, diplomats uh, responded indirectly uh, to my findings. And you will not be surprised uh, to hear that they largely uh, denounced uh, them as exaggerated and uh, did not want to recognize them as such. However, uh, the evidence is so overwhelming uh, that there can be no doubt uh, on the problems existing on the ground and we are going to hear much more about it in the next session anyway. With regard to OSCE, uh, there is the representative on the freedom of the media 
which already in the past has made uh, several uh, statements regarding the situation in Belarus and also recently again. Uh, in this way, the OEC institution in charge of media freedom and safety of journalists is speaking out from time to time on the situation on the ground, and they are also monitoring uh, this situation. Certainly, uh, they have their limits because the OEC is a consensus institution, and decisions of the OEC political bodies are therefore difficult against uh, the position of Belarus, Russia, and their friends. However, uh, this monitoring is taking place, and uh, as much as the representative on the freedom of the media is concerned, she is able uh, to speak out, and this is also happening. Thank you, Professor. On behalf of uh, all the participants of this conference, I pledge you to continue such steps, especially the monitoring, because all these actions do have a very important effect on the situation. Now I would like to ask Vitis Jurkonis. A short question, maybe. The recent ratings in Belarus, everything seems that we have reached the bottom. What about the state television, then? How does it comment the situation? What have you noticed? What, what are the answers given by Belarusian authorities or even decisions in that effect? Well, I believe uh, we have to compare of the reaction five years ago when the situation was not still that uh, gloomy. The Belarusian authorities still tried to find some justification because they needed positive figures about progress when talking to Europe. So there have been many manipulations until now. Today, everyone sees how bad the situation is that, and there is no uh, absolutely need for denial. However, the Belarusian authorities don't seem to even have illusions about any dialogue, any possible dialogue. And this is why they try to manipulate, they try to state that uh, the Western democracies uh, try to pose some geopolitical challenge, whatever. But what we see is a clear fight between democracy and authoritarian regime against the terror. So we shouldn't have any doubts on which side we have to be on. Sometimes we just have to encourage our colleagues of international community that we need to stand for democracy, for human rights, because this is what we are. We are the basis of Europe. Thank you, Vitis. I would like to ask uh, Resto Kuzel. You rightly mentioned that the independent media, elimination of this media, arrests and other measures have left to state media as dominating in the country. How could you comment the evolution of the state media, even that so some journalists representing it also faced repressions. However, how would you in general describe the evolution of state media in the course of the last nine months? Mr. Kujel. Thank you very much for this uh, question. Uh, I think uh, what we have seen is really, and I think what I would just like to, uh, in a way, reiterate, is that the regime tried to use the same methods uh, as, as in all the previous elections. So 
in fact, uh, Lukashenko ran an analog campaign in a digital age, uh, so to say. So again, relying very much on the state uh, TV propaganda. And in that sense, uh, we haven't really seen uh, any any big uh, sort of developments, uh, you know, when I look at the, the historical uh, perspective, you know, when I look at the, 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 the previous years and the previous elections. I think very importantly, uh, after the elections, uh, we saw uh, that, uh, that there were uh, some journalists uh, on state uh, television that basically uh, refused to continue, uh, which in a way reminded me of a, a similar situation, for example, in Ukraine uh, after 2004 uh, during the, the Orange Revolution. So, so I think this was a very important signal that uh, that not everyone is ready uh, to to sort of uh, do this type of blatant uh, propaganda. At the same time, uh, what we see nowadays is uh, continuation of this propaganda, describing the protesters as extremists and terrorists. Uh, you know, using emotions uh, to sort of uh, paint a picture uh, which is of, uh, of 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 huge contrast. And I'm sure that uh, maybe Andre will talk a little bit more about this um, uh, as, as, as the Belarusian Association of Journalists is doing monitoring into this respect. So maybe uh, just uh, very briefly to respond to your question. Thank you, Mr. Kujel. Now I address Mr. Zhigimantas Pavilonis. You mentioned that it was not no coincidence that Lithuania, together with Poland, is taking a lot of initiatives. Can we expect anything new in this field? While seeing that the fourth package of sanctions is inevitable, what can we expect on the regional level in terms of political initiative? Well, I just expect one strong action, one, one firm step, which is the active involvement of the new U.S. administration, which is the power that can make Putin retreat, because they have all the necessary tools. This is what I hope for, and I very much hope that this it is, will be implemented by the meeting between Biden and Putin in June this year. A short answer. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have had an honor to moderate this part of our discussion. Thank you for your comments, for your interventions, and I hope that your involvement in observing the situation in Belarus will remain in place and that our cooperation will give Belarusian people more hope to fight for their democracy and for their rights that we are discussing today. Dainus, back to you. Thank you, Patras. Thank you, participants of the first session. And now we go to the second part of our session, which is important because of the two uh, reasons. The right of expression, journalism in Belarus. I often speak that the right of expression is the right of people to be themselves, and journalism is a profession that has a privilege to use the freedom of expression more, more than others. And this is also the profession that suffers mostly because, because when we face with democrat, anti-democratic regimes. So this is quite a difficult choice, I would say. I am happy that Ginas Dabashinskas, a professional moderator, will take over the moderation of this session. Ginas, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, Ginas. I am happy to be with you here today. Let me uh, congratulate everyone with the day of the restoration of uh, a Lithuanian uh, press. And I see a highly logical structure 
We have political processes discussed in this conference with some affiliations related to political uh, society. And the second session of this conference, as we heard, is about journalism and self-expression. It's like a mirror which does not just passively reflect what's going on, but also which formulates responsibility, accountability, and some forecasts where the process leads to. So that level, I believe, is no less important. And they both are in closely interrelated. I could go on talking about it. However, the more I live in, the, in a democratic state, uh, the more I clearly understand that sticking to the rules is an alphabet. Even if you have a very big wish, sometimes you still have to look at what is prescribed by the rules. Now I would like to give the floor to the chairman of the Belarusian Association of Journalists. We have four uh, presenters in this part of our conference, so if we have time, we can have a discussion together. Mr. Andre, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Seven minutes, if you don't mind. Good afternoon. Thank you for the possibility to participate in this conference, and thank you for discussing this particular topic. That's the situation. We are only celebrating today in Lithuania, the, you are celebrating the Day of Restoration of the Lithuanian Press in Belarus. We have the Day of Radio on the 3rd of May. We celebrated the World Press Freedom Day. And uh, our routine is quite different from holidays, though. On the 3rd of May, the civilized world celebrated the World Press Freedom Day. Whereas on the next day, the Ministry of Information of the Republic of Belarus issued an official warning to the regional newspaper Intexpress from Baranovici for publishing an interview with Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya. And on the 5th of May, the Economic Court of the Brest Oblast fined the newspaper's editorial office with almost uh, one and a half thousand euro for distributing the information which was called extremist. At the same time, the police began checking the publication under Article 361 of the Criminal Code of the Republic of Belarus, calls to actions aimed at harming the national security of the Republic of Belarus. Bel Pochta refused to include the newspaper in the subscription catalog, and uh, Bel Seus Press refused to sell it through kiosks. It's not an isolated accident. The ban on printing and distributing newspapers since August last year was confronted by print publications, in fact. The publications like uh, People's Will, Bel Gazette, uh, Free News Plus, even Komsomolskaya Pravda in Belarus, Slonimskaya Gazeta, Brestskaya Gazeta were banned. 
most of them had to stop printing and switch to the Internet instead. But, as we have already heard today, the freedom of speech is severely restricted. Authorities have blocked access to almost 100 independent online publications. YouTube, Telegram are also restricted as well as the local chat rooms and social media commentators. One of the biggest websites in Belarus has been stripped of media status. The Prussian journalists has also increased. They are being persecuted on a daily basis. And about 500 of journalists were detained last year. About 100 were arrested. This has been going on until now. 11 journalists and media professionals are imprisoned with criminal charges. Three of them, Katerina Andreeva, Daria Shultsova and Katerina Borisevich, have already been sentenced to imprisonment for a term of six months to two years for their ordinary journalistic activities, their professional duties. Shultsova and Andreeva have been providing coverage from protests on the streets. Katerina Borisevich learned that one of the opposition activists was murdered and gave the coverage. She was detained just for disclosing the doctor's information. Arrests, fines, searches, seizure of equipment, violence against journalists have become a practice of their professional activities. Today I am able to talk to you through Zoom platform. However, a few months ago all our devices were uh, seized. We still haven't got some equipment back. I am constantly invited to various interrogations. Some of my colleagues are in prison today who are interrogated uh, not as often as their colleagues uh, who are still uh, not detained. What I would also like to note is that all that is also uh, covered by state media and they are using a hard language of enmity, accuse people who cannot defend themselves of all kinds of crimes, spread explicit propaganda, including pro-Russian one. Representatives of the media community will not announce their appeal to state bodies. And these are the cases when the secret of uh, research allows the authorities present the false information. Russian and Belarusian propaganda are working jointly together. Now they have a joint project which is directed against social media. So the conditions that we are facing now is nothing like a festive occasion. This is kind of Belarusian norm, which is not normal, far from it. One hour ago, about 
a statement of about 100 journalists and uh, editors was publicized. These are all uh, well-known people, and it's uh, called put an end on witch hunting, because what we are facing now is really uh, witch hunting. It's also related to journalists and bloggers, the ones who are posting information on social media, including politicians. Any citizen, when people who think differently are persecuted and uh, social uh, media workers have publicized their demands including free their colleagues, bring back the non-state media to the common media space, put an end to the interference by state bodies in the media and administrative pressure imposed on journalists and media. These are the conditions guaranteed by international documents and commitments that Belarus has undertaken. Thank you so much for having the opportunity to be with you. Thank you very much. And now I believe that the questions can be asked later on after other presentations. Now I would like to give the floor to Natalia Frolova, who is a journalist for The Insider. She lives in Lithuania. Well, the question was raised whether it is time to speak about Russia, because uh, Natalia Frolova is from Russia originally, but uh, actually the issues of uh, media in Belarus and uh, Russia are very si Belarus and Russia are very similar. Yes, uh, the Russian independent media and Belarusian independent media are on the same side and suffer the same situation because uh, the government of both the countries uh, work hand in hand. And in this situation, it is difficult to compare, of course, uh, the situation of the Belarusian journalists with those of Russian. We see the situation, we follow that it is a very aggravating situation but uh, we can really envy you in Belarus because many people in your country and many journalists as far as I understand as far as my experience uh, shows on this uh, breakthrough, Belarusian people and journalists uh, were able to choose the side because you cannot remain in this gray zone anymore because you understand when people kill people on the streets, the journalists cannot uh, stay in the national radio and television without uh, reacting and pretending not to notice. And therefore, many journalists left their jobs at national television Radio. On the other hand, uh, for the Belarusian media, independent media and protesters, should really be happy because they have uh, uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya because she actually was elected as president. We do not have similar leaders. We have Navalny who is in prison now. Well, a very, a very small uh, group of people still support uh, Navalny. And in Russia, this division and split uh, between people who disagree with the current policies of Putin and those who support him is very big. And the independent media is in support of these people who are against. And this small percentage is very much polarized with the main authorities and governments. Uh, ну, 
And I think uh, uh, the Russian authorities uh, can more easily change the situation or fight with this opposing media because it is uh, remain unnoticed to the general public. And it is uh, even on a more active scale. We can speak and discuss different political reasons in Belarus and in uh, Russia. Maybe Putin is afraid of uh, something what happened in Belarus. Uh, while uh, sep in September Russia will have elections and Putin wants to establish his further ruling uh, period. Because last year he made uh, this uh, constitutional revolution. But most importantly, all those political events and developments starting from uh, the war in Georgia, Crimea, poisoning of Litvinenko in Skripal situation in London, Crimea war in uh, Ukraine, all this list could uh, be complemented uh, and then attack on Navalny, uh, bombings in Europe, uh, provocations uh, on the European uh, soil. And when the journalist understands that, he uh, realizes that he lives in a country and works as a journalist in a country where the authorities are criminals, actually. And in this situation, it is a very difficult to be objective as a journalist. To be on the other side. And in some, at some point, journalists cannot observe the principles of the BBC, for example, working in a war zone and speak about uh, the opinion or the position of the uh, Russian or, say, Ukrainian troops. The Russian press, um, the, I mean, independent uh, Russian media finds it very difficult to be independent because uh, it is in the situation where there is a uh, uh, a war, a social war. And dependent media in Russia are very few and far between. And they are either international, uh, financed uh, from abroad, or just a group of Russian journalists who manage to register themselves uh, in other countries. For example, Medusa and Insider registered in Latvia. So I believe that such uh, examples will increase in the future. The authorities uh, are trying to marginalize uh, those media outlets even more and to eliminate them from this uh, space. The government is always uh, trying to improve its repressive mechanisms that were established uh, some years ago. Well, the law on international a agents exists since 2012. Different organizations, non-commercial organizations, uh, public organizations uh, fell under this title and they were forced to be closed because they could not receive funding. And these were organizations that were helping people. From the beginning of this year, this list of international agents included uh, media outlets and uh, individuals, uh, bloggers, for example, who write something on social media. They can be uh, recognized as uh, foreign agents just because they have uh, a number of followers. And we have 19 points in this list. Uh, 
Голос Америки, American Voice, Radio Free Europe also were included on this list. Meduza was uh, also recognized as a foreign agent. Sometime before, people understood that uh, that uh, they live at risk, but it is very difficult to understand how the adopted laws will be applied in specific situations. And sometimes uh, um, the situation is that, for example, some threat cannot be can be avoided. And this uh, flexibility that I've just mentioned is uh, used for for media and for fighting free media. With Medusa, we see the situation when the sponsors um, are no more, do, uh, cannot support them anymore. It is reflected on uh, the listeners who will be. And this is uh, a new law on the information which is very vague and uh, it is very difficult to understand it and its application is very uh, flexible. All these threats, uh, growing threats and something uh, mentioned by Professor Benedek, when foreign journalists uh, are not granted accreditation, all those uh, negative factors uh, are increasing and the situation is uh, very gloomy. Very many journalists uh, uh, dream to leave the country because they really feel pressure. They're afraid uh, to be... And it is very difficult for them to survive under this pressure. And finally, the conclusions uh, and uh, the outcomes are very sad. We had a situation, we had uh, an example when one journalist was endlessly persecuted. Thank you very much for your presentation. Since we are out of time, we could uh, continue, but unfortunately we have uh, to stop here. Now, I would like to give the floor to Hanna Lubakova, um, the Belarusian journalist uh, in exile. The floor is yours. Uh, hello. I'll switch hello. To uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um, so, well, thank you for inviting me and thank you for organizing this important conference. Uh, first of all, um, I was asked to speak a little bit about Katerina Andreeva and Daria Shulsova, who are both a TV journalist who have been sentenced to two years in prison for just live streaming from, from a protest. Um, uh, they, they're journalists from Balsa TV and my friends, um, brilliant professionals. Um, and in order to start, um, I'll start with Katerina's words that she told her husband um, in, uh, when they met in Georgian prison. Uh, she said that, uh, imagine how these officers feel when they understand that they fought against the girls and lost in this war. Um, it clearly um, shows, and I do agree, that security forces actually lost here. Firstly, uh, Katarina and Daria are heroes, and everyone uh, perceives, them, uh, perceives them so. Um, they receive a lot of support from people um, and all over the world. Um, and secondly, they are the bravest, they are, they are courageous. Um, 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 on November 15, when, uh, when Katerina Andreeva and Darya Shitsova were, were arrested and when security forces uh, broke into the apartment from which they were uh, live streaming, reporting on a protest, 
uh, Katza said that they had a chance to escape. They had another apartment uh, which was not exposed and where uh, they could um, uh, kind of leave and, and hide there. But when they saw uh, all these security forces who um, arrived and began um, um, kind of uh, suppressing, dispersing protesters who, who gathered at this um, at this uh, Porsche Premen, at this change square where um, Roman Bandarenka was uh, commemorated, um, where was this national memorial, um, they decided to stay in that apartment and perform their professional duties. Um, and I would say that this is something that uh, represents, uh, that clearly symbolizes what independent journalism in Belarus is, because they are um, dedicated to their cause, uh, dedicated to their profession, and they understand their mission to uh, spread information, to report truthfully on events, um, and uh, help people get access to uh, to facts, data, and know uh, and um, kind of um, explaining to people what, what's happening in the country. Cuts and that represent not only their media outlets, but um, they shape how news media in, is perceived by uh, different parts of the public because they're strong and resilient, and that's how journalism in Belarus currently uh, perceived as well. So people in Belarus uh, understand the value of free speech in media. They respect independent uh, journalists. They uh, tried to protect us many times by surrounding us um, in circles when police arrived and wanted to detain us, or they left us in their apartments when uh, also security forces arrived and, and so that we could use Wi-Fi because there was internet shutdown. So uh, people perceive us as allies um, and they um, kind of also try to help us. Uh, the citizen journalism became really important. That's how I report at this moment because while well, people in Belarus on the ground, witnesses send me information, send me videos and, and pictures um, and, and some um, kind of insights. And, and that's, how, that's how I can, um, I can report. Um, as if I was uh, I was there myself. Um, so that's kind of this um, optimistic part of it, this positive part of it. Uh, there is also um, a kind of dark um, uh, dark side. Uh, if you look at the case of Igor Osik or Katerina Borisevich or Press Club, um, when Igor Osik was detained last June, um, we thought that he would be um, released immediately because his charges were really uh, kind of false and, and, and we did not believe that it's possible to kind of well, detain a person for this. Um, and um, on the same day when he was detained, a criminal case was launched against him and the interior, former interior minister, Euro, Minister Yuri Karayev, explained that um, he was detained, um, um, he was among those bloggers who, were, who organized protests uh, through YouTube and Telegram. Um, so we made, immediately understood that uh, there would be a war against us, basically. Uh, uh, the regime always treated independent media um, in Belarus as something that they would kind of prefer not to see, uh, something that is not needed. Uh, but now it's just, um, I would say, some sort of extermination. They just um, simply uh, want us to not exist in Belarus at all. I was asking myself why journalists and bloggers have become so dangerous for the regime. And the example of Sergei Tikhanovsky, the owner of a popular Telegram channel, the country for life is, uh, is crucial. Uh, by the way, he, was, uh, he announced one year ago uh, that, that he, he, he wants to run for president. Um, so he challenged Lukashenko by interviewing people all across the country and they were openly saying uh, to him that they want Lukashenko to go. And that's how people basically all over the country saw that um, many, many people are against Lukashenko. And uh, it, this is not only Minsk, but also people in really small towns are, um, are against the, uh, the leader. And that's something that uh, official propaganda usually tried to hide. They wanted to show that only the capital protests and those regional folks are really kind of uh, supporters of, of Alexander Lukashenko. Um, and uh, then Lukashenko saw that he won't be able, that he wouldn't be able to appease 
people who are so angry um, and lower their discontent. So when Sikhanovsky announced that he wanted to run in the, um, in the presidential elections, he was immediately arrested. Um, and Lukashenko was right about his fears because state propaganda, Lukashenko himself, he's lost monopoly over people's minds in the past years, I would say, and especially in the past year, uh, which was visible during the pandemic. Um, Lukashenko, I think, underestimated the hunger, uh, people's hunger for truth um, and their mobilization and their politicization. This is not uh, the society that I uh, used to see before, I would say. And even when I traveled across the country, I saw this myself. People were so self-organized and so willing, so kind of um, wanting a change and wanting Lukashenko to go. And I think this is not... Um, possible to stop anymore. And um, that's why these protests, this discontent did not disappear and will not disappear. Um, what I find really positive is this trust and um, um, popularity, I would say, of the journalists, of bloggers, who are now a really important source of, of information for people. Um, and that's something that might be a kind of a very different trend from what we see around the world. Um, in Belarus, social media is really important, I would say, for for spreading information. Telegram is one of these uh, kind of trusted sources in Belarus. Um, so, um, so to me, well, Lukashenko lost. Uh, repressions are now the only uh, mean how to stay, in, how he uh, is able to stay in power um, and kind of keep control over information and over the situation. Um, and that's why he fights so hard uh, against uh, journalists and bloggers in Belarus. So, um, um, yeah, so I would stay. I would. I would stop here. I think um, it's just uh, just to finish. Um, there are obviously um, um, the level of repression is unprecedented, but again, the level of solidarity with journalists and bloggers and among us journalists and bloggers in Belarus is is also unprecedented. So we try to support each other, and people also try to support us, um, mm -hmm. and that's something that gives me a lot of hope. А чи пони Ганни Любокової ж дома сіж волгас ліки та сумніс? Thank you, Madam Lubakova, for an interesting insights. Please stay with us. Maybe some questions will follow. And now the last uh, speaker on this uh, panel, Nastasia Yaman. Ladies and gentlemen, in the first place, I'd like to thank organizers of this event, as well as. Um, members of Lithuanian and European parliaments for multi-dimension and um, continuous support of free media in Belarus. Uh, and it's really pleasant to notice that more than 10 Lithuanian parliamentarians joined the initiative MP for Freedom. Remarkably that uh, four of them, in, including the Lansana Vichuta, uh, Victoria Chmilita Nilsen, took symbolic gut parenthood over Belarusian journalists. It's, uh, Daria Chultsova, Igor Losi, Katerina Borisevich, and Yulia Slutska. Uh, thank you very much for the solidarity expressed. Last year was not to blame for turning the life of reporters in Belarus into hell. A long time ago, in 1997, it was a really bad sign when a journalist became one of the first ever political prisoners in Belarus, and his name was Pavel Shoramet. Since then, day-to-day -day responsibilities like acquiring official information, street interviews, performing investigations turned into a challenge for Belarusian independent media. Even if outlet has a registered status, it can feel free. It is constantly jeopardized. And an editor always needs to think first before he will publish something critical towards the state vertical structures. But eventually, this is what happened in 2020 to almost every free Belarusian media. For instance, the accreditation of Belarusian service of Radio Liberty was revoked, and the most popular website, Tutbai, as already Andrei Bastunes mentioned, it lost uh, its official status of the media outlet. Undoubtedly, having accreditation in today's Belarus doesn't guarantee safety for any 
journalists under current conditions, when the constitution or any other law, law is just a simply a matter of interpretation for authorities. There is a media project on the web uh, called August 2020, which collects terrifying stories of repressed uh, people in Belarus. But I think that journalists can publish its own book uh, about disregard, about violations, and about violence towards them. We can still remember the detention of Ruslan Kulevich. It's a journalist from Krodno. During his detention, his both arms were broken by police, and he was shocked so much that he didn't even uh, notice that. Uh, a vest with the title press in the war zones usually serves to save lives of journalists, save their health. But last year in Belarus, this vest become, became something quite the opposite. At peaceful protests, it became a target for a police hunt. That is how Nashuniva reporter Natalia Lubnievska got shot in her leg with a rubber bullet. And we can still remember a reporter from Netherlands who got uh, uh, injured in her leg with a flashbang grenade. And of course, after uh, this great uh, representation of Andre Bastonet, we still remember the sealed door of Belarusian Association of Journalists after it was searched uh, with regard to a criminal case. Nowadays, loyalty, lack of initiative and total being under command are the main warful features for a legitimate ruler. This winter, Alexander Lukashenko awarded several state media authors who were especially active in justifying violence. State television correspondent uh, Rigor Azaronek got a medal for bravery, and Igor Tur was awarded with a reward of Francisk Skarina name, the first pressman and Grand Duchy of Lithuania. He would basically cry, I think. Today, my colleagues in Minsk and other cities don't give up on their job du duties. However, it looks more like underground work than their typ typical journalistic routine. We can't follow YouTube streams anymore. Now the streams are officially a criminal offense. Instead, my, coll instead, my colleagues tend to hide while they, they observe street events, some of them regularly change uh, rented apartments just to prevent detention or to postpone it, probably. I cannot find appropriate words to support mom of Dasha Trilsova. Uh, she received a drawing from Dasha. I have it here. It's with a big mother bear. <laughs> um, and Dasha painted it in the uh, Jodina prison. Dasha is 24. Um, she already serves her two years um, imprisonment uh, term. Uh, it was already mentioned that uh, she, together with um, Katerina Andreo, was detained during the live stream in November. By the way, they are both recognized extremists in the prison already. On Katya's personal file, in no uncertain terms, it's written Zmaharka, or fighter. Uh, that is the word st state propaganda is usually uses to, regarding protesters for a long time already. Kaisa's husband, Igor, got an opportunity to talk to her through a glass partition in April, for the first time since November. He said that she stays in a cheerful spirits. However, she felt COVID symptoms, but no one cares to test in the prison. We wait for Katya Borisevich, to Dubai journalist, to be released on 19th uh, of May, after serving a six-month prison term. It will be a big happy day, but it won't be a day of victory, although. Ten more journalists are kept behind bars. At least a dozen of blo bloggers are as well. Strong support of each of them from abroad means a lot. Permanent media stories on Belarus and parliamentarians' attention keep imprisoned Belarusian journalists on the spot. So thank you for that, and I believe it will be proceeding. And this pressure brings close the, the day when uh, the last journalist will be released from behind the bars. Thank you so much.
su didžiausių mano Thank you, Anastasia. I would be glad to add something and uh, ask a question, but I will instead give the floor to the moderator, Dairus Rezavičius, who will introduce the third part of our discussion, where we probably will have a chance to ask questions. Well, the discussion is extremely important for us here today, and not only for us, because we speak about the future. I was quite happy that Dalasa Navichute is going to moderate the discussion. She is in the same as today, and political leadership is very important, I believe. But I, in Dalas' case, I think her life experience is very important also in trying to understand that not all the people can live in their own country for, for some reason. She herself lived lived abroad for many years, and my remark is the more totalitarian regime presses on people to stay in their own country, to shut from the rest of the world, the practice shows that we have more and more people who become the citizens of the world, and I hope that Dela will find many interesting points to mention in the discussion. Thank you, Dainus. As an immigrant, I have uh, repeatedly heard that Lithuania probably pushed us away. But speaking about Belarusians and their fight for freedom, I can say that no, Lithuania has never pushed us away. It just opened the borders when we became the member of the European Union, and we have a choice. And I think Belarusians now have the right to choose their future and their president, even though sometimes in Lithuania we complain we have chosen the wrong ones, Again, Belarusians don't have that chance at all. We have been speaking about the time, current time, when people are beaten, when they disappear. When in Ireland, I have had a chance to meet young people from Belarus at the end of uh, August. Last year, we were standing united with the ha flags in our hands. I often heard the request from those people, please don't put my name on social media because I want to see my mom, my, my children, I want to visit my home country, which sounds quite unbelievable to us now. Lithuania has made its way, the way to independence. Belarusians are doing that now, and what we can do is to support them to stretch our hand of help. So I would now like to speak about the future. Maybe I will just change the procedure, if I may, because I have wonderful uh, people who can speak about the vision of the future, about the strategy. I will ask them to make a short introduction, and then I will ask a question. I'm really glad to give the floor to Karin Kalsbro from Sweden, a member of the European Parliament, the deputy chair of the uh, group for interparliamentary relations with Belarus. So, Karin, what is the vision from the perspective of the European Parliament? Thank you so much for, for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you to uh, the, the Lithuanian Parliament and to all colleagues and uh, uh, friends in Lithuania and Belarus. Um, I'm sure one day Belarus will be a free country. I'm fully convinced of that for several reasons. The people have shown an extraordinary courage and determination not to give up before they have their freedom. And as we 
all know a regime built on violence, on oppression and lies has no future. But it's important that we keep up the international attention to what's going on. And without free media and without free journalists who can do their job, the truth is in danger. Our message from the European Parliament and from the European countries must be very, very clear. Journalism is not a crime. All journalists has to be released, as well as all political prisoners, of course. And, but until the oppression and violence towards journalists, as well as ordinary citizens, uh, has stopped, we must continue to put pressure on the regime. And all, all of you who provide us with the truth and the information play a key role, because without your job, we can't do our job. And I really appreciate the network of activists all over Europe, in Sweden, but in all European countries, who provide us, us with information on a daily basis or every week with the truth of what's going on in Belarus. And without the truth, we can't act. So we have to do this together. And I will also underline that we, we should not be naive because from, from the experience from, from my own country, uh, the latest months, you have to continue to spread information among uh, media, among journalists, uh, among influ influencers of the truth what's going on in Belarus, because suddenly happen things that make you shocked. For example, just to let, uh, to, if I may uh, give you uh, an example, when the Belarusian state TV was invited to be part of the international jury in the, um, in the national Eurovision competition in Sweden, it, it was a shock to all of us how this could happen. Uh, we all know that the president for the state TV channel is on the European Union sanctions list. He has nothing to do in a Swedish music uh, competition. Uh, so I think what you provide us when, when free journalists are not free, uh, the information, the truth, which all of you who act on different ways provide us with on Twitter, on bloggers, uh, on blogs, uh, what you write and uh, all what you do. The truth is the tool for to support a free Belarus. And uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm fully sure that freedom will come. Thank you, Karin. I would like to ask you a provocative question, if I may. A question about the sanctions, because the three packages of sanctions have been already applied. We should not be naive. As you said, Lithuania is not naive. And uh, the list of sanctions that Lithuania proposes is more wider. Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya is asking for the fourth package of sanctions. Why the European Union is not so willing to apply it? And what position is going to take in the further stages, do you think? I fully support uh, wider and tougher sanctions. And uh, it's just to, to admit that the European Union, uh, the member states together, they have acted too slowly, slowly uh, with uh, uh, not enough courage uh, for a long time. Uh, we, 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 we were satisfied that in the end, we saw the, the new sanctions list last year but it's far away from enough. 
and it was too late. So uh, I will try together with colleagues to push for, for this. And I think it's urgent. And what's going on in Belarus right now shows how important it is. And I know that Lithuania is really a front runner on this. And I think we have to, uh, to work together for to achieve this. It's so important. Thank you. I think it's excellent to know that Lithuania has friends in the European Parliament, not only from Lithuania, but other countries as well. Thank you, Karin. Now I'd like to give the floor to Manta Sodomienas, uh, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, who is responsible for Belarus. Uh, Vice Minister, criminal persecution is applied against Belarusian uh, uh, journalists just for uh, carrying out their responsibilities. You said so. So you know the situation and you can really comment on that. Thank you very much. When we speak about a threat to the freedom of self express freedom of expression and freedom of press, well, I found this on my chair. Please uh, do not uh, sit down here. Please do not sit down. So this is my wish for the Belarusian journalists. Don't be put to prison. While preparing for this forum, I will step aside a little bit and speak about uh, possible scenarios, about uh, possible geopolitical developments. Uh, and then I will uh, return to uh, media journalists and how we can help them. Now we have four scenarios of the development of Belarus for some time that actually compete among each other. The first one and the most depressive is the scenario that can be called the Venezuela scenario. But actually in Venezuela we have the scenario of Belarus. This could be called new normal or déjà vu scenario when the regime manages to remain the pressure coming from different sides from the east for some negative transformation manages to preserve its power and the illusion of control. I think that this is an illusion and it can be sustained for a rather long time. Well, the constitutional um, amendments are being drafted and they are in line with Lukashenko's uh, wishes. The fatigue among the Western countries can be noticed. The sanctions remain, but Actually, the same situation in the vicious circle repeats uh, rigged elections, uh, violence against the population, and uh, Belarus is uh, moving towards uh, Russia. This would be a very depressive scenario, and we should nor not uh, accept the new normal. Uh, the second scenario is the Russia-controlled authorities. We can see pro-Russian parties uh, and the birth of pro-Russian parties in Belarus. The constitutional reform in these circumstances uh, could uh, give the floor to fluent replacement of uh, Lukashenko with uh, Another personality from the East, uh, pseudo-democratic elections are held when uh, the candidates are pro-Russian, and this would be uh, useful to appease uh, fighters for democracies. And uh, the West thinks that the absence of Lukashenko is the end of the headache. But actually, this is the scenario of a total control of Belarus by Russia and pseudo-democracy. 
with the Western um, funding. The third scenario is the scenario of uh, synchronization of uh, state systems on the areas level by the end of the year and possible solutions uh, that Lukashenko often mentions. This would be very fateful decisions in Lukashenko's life, and this would mean uh, the creation of the Union State. This would be bad news uh, for people in Belarus because uh, the authoritarian regime would remain. This would uh, uh, remain for a very long, for a very long period. And the fourth scenario, which is that we want very much, um, includes. Um, in Dialogue with the Coordination Council, uh, elections uh, with a new commission and uh, international observers uh, for the election. Well, actually, we see this on the horizon, but this horizon is very distant. All these four scenarios are on our menu for a very long time, but our question is uh, which scenario will uh, be implemented. And I sh would like to say that we should not uh, uh, succumb to fatalism. This resistance uh, means that we have a potential for change. We need to have patience and we need to be brave. So it all depends on the civic society, on renewed protests, new forms of protest probably. Um, it would depend on the pressure from democratic world and the media. And now returning back to the media. The media is something which uh, disseminates the free word uh, to Belarusian people. We can help the media and journalists working in complicated circumstances. Without the support uh, and tools that we can offer, we should also define uh, several important areas that our ministry works at. First, uh, recording violations. This is extremely important. Uh, the Justice Hub uh, and creation of this Justice Hub, uh, which records and legally evaluates those violations. In, independent group of experts established uh, in the U.S. in February is a very important factor here. One more important aspect is uh, intolerance to impunity. We have uh, four countries that support us and support our reaction to the violations in Belarus. Belarus's accountability platform as a legal platform helps uh, to record the violations and help uh, accountability for them. And the last uh, point is uh, pressure. UNESCO, United Nations, uh, OEC formats, Raise this issue of Belarus, raises the issue of Belarus on a constant basis, and sanctions uh, which are effective as far as uh, this nervous reaction of Belarusian uh, leader shows. Sanctions are effective, therefore they will have to be expanded. We should not uh, stop, we should uh, uh, maintain our course. And I think that the regime is cracking, and this is a sign which shows that we have to continue our efforts. And together with the help of uh, 
independent media and independent journalists, we will uh, be able to attain victory. Please, uh, uh, may you not be put in prison. Excellent. Thank you so much. In general, you recalled what our previous presenters have mentioned, that we all need apply pressure on different platforms in applying the fourth package of sanctions so that the democratic elections take place as soon as possible. And the fourth scenario that everyone is looking forward is very significant. But what journalists have mentioned is, is Lithuania really ready to support because uh, journalists don't have financial resources, they need equipment, they need even procedures in place so that they could freely work further. So my question is as follows. On the 10th of uh, May, Ministers of Foreign Affairs are meeting in Brussels. What does the... Ministry of Foreign Affairs expect, and another question is very simple, can we help not only by inserting the pressure, but also maybe uh, give some financial support, or in terms of equipment? The issue of Belarus will be discussed next Monday by ministers of foreign affairs of the European countries. This is the question that ministers come back to now and again. The progress of the fourth package of sanctions will be also discussed. The meeting ex uh, dedicated exceptionally to Belarus is planned for June this year, where we also expect the participation of the opposition leader of Belarus. The fourth package of sanctions is uh, moving forward, is being moved forward at the end of May. We can expect uh, a more ambitious uh, set of ang uh, actions, sanctions compared to what it looked before. And of course, as far as the support to journalists is concerned, we are doing really a lot, but I will be able to tell you about that in private. Thank you, Vice Minister. As we heard, Lithuania has a clear set of values, and thank you to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Now I would like to give the floor to uh, Ambassador Andrus Polokas, Lithuania's ambassador in Belarus. Maybe I will ask a question later, but without leaving our own citizens uh, forgotten or neglected, because we do have Lithuanian citizens in Belarus, what is their position and do they also experience any pressure or repressions from the regime, Mr. Ambassador? Thank you for the opportunity to take part in this event. I am the ambassador, but I am in Vilnius. And uh, it probably serves to show that in our neighboring country, the historic neighbors, uh, not everything is well there today, and that the country is living in enormous pressure conditions. And if we now discuss the future, I can just look back, let's say one year ago, when everything seemed a bit differently. I can just state that the disbalance, the 
tension between the authorities and ordinary people, society representatives, is tremendous, is massive. I can just say that the progress has been made by both the parties, and I would like to focus mostly on the regime what it has done to its civil society. Even though sometimes when joking, I can say that uh, a book could be released on how to quench any democratic changes. It could be a manual of the 21st century on how one should behave and the man manual would probably consist of two uh, sections. First, coercion. Second, propaganda. We have already discussed today that uh, the bottom line seems to be reached. However, every day we hear now and again about new developments, creative ways and methods, to put it this way, to quench any free thought, any different opinion. Unfortunately, the distance between the regime and the Belarusian society is huge. But the civil society has made a very impressive progress. I think this is a historical achievement, and we are going to discuss it for many years to come, because the Belarusian nation has been born. The civil society, and I also see some new trends even in journalism, as I know many people have many acquaintances working as journalists, I see the unique phenomenon of journalist solidarity. In democratic countries, we are used to the situation when journalists are not always agreeing on different subjects. And this is quite normal, I would say. But in Belarus, all journalists are in solidarity, whereas on the other side you see the executors of propaganda. The four scenarios mentioned by Vice Minister are quite realistic, in fact, and much will depend on how the two political systems or components of the real life, which is the regime and the civil society, will progress further. And here we speak about things which are of topical importance on every day. Every day. As an ambassador, I could also mention one element we haven't touched upon today, which is the isolation of the state and the public and the society. Let us understand that Belarusian people are facing difficulties to leave the country, whereas the opportunities to travel are probably one of the essential conditions for the, for the people, for the country. And even the process of issuing visas seems to be extremely complicated. Due to the coronavirus, Belarus is going to be completely shut because the people of that country will not have Schengen visas in the future, and Lithuania and Poland will not have an opportunity to issue the visas 
promptly to them. So now I think it's time to think about how we are going to address this problem, because we do have some ideas how to do it. We need to understand is that both Lithuania and Poland are the key countries that have guaranteed some exit to Europe, gate to Europe to Belarusian people, and we have to secure that further. I would also uh, be in favor with other discussions like liberalization of the visa regime, maybe uh, refusing any fee, any visa issuance fee. We need to show to Belarusian people some clear signals that we haven't forgotten them, not just in our statements, but in our specific actions. Another point I would like to mention is related to the COVID situation. Belarus cannot boast on very big achievements uh, in terms of vaccination. I know that only 3% of people have been vaccinated, have received the first jab in Belarus. The country that has been denying the threat of the pandemic is definitely facing big difficulties today. And uh, you know, Belarus has always had a lot of problems as far as statistics is concerned. We don't know the exact scale, but we can understand that situation is really tragic there. So we should really sit and think how we can help the country with vaccination, particularly the active part of population who could probably go to other European countries and have a chance to get vaccinated there. I think these are the matters that we need to address on a daily basis because this is something that ordinary people are facing. It is the seven month now that I have been in Vilnius already, and this is why I don't feel the exactly the pulse what's going on in Belarus. But from all my contacts and all the flow of information that I receive is that people's determination for changes is not decreasing. Maybe it's just gaining new forms with the new waves of repressions uh, in view of the atmosphere of fear and the causes for to be looking forward to freedom are still in place. I do believe in the fourth scenario. I believe it's inevitable and it's probably just a matter of time when it's going to be implemented. Uh, seizing this opportunity, let me just wish strength and perseverance to all the Belarusian people and journalists in particular. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Excellency Ambassador. You really touched an important topic about visas. Since September last year, Belarusian citizens visas are being issued to Belarusian citizens um, in, in a simplified uh, procedure. A number of uh, humanitarian visas in a simplified procedure have been issued. So you should say that uh, we should liberalize the issuing of visas. Well, something that we have now is in line with the demand because, uh, because the pandemic situation is very tense and the issue of visas on uh, um, the EU level is being halted. Uh, only um, uh, labor visas and humanitarian visas are being issued. I have in mind uh, the period when the pandemic situation will improve. 
And we hope that in the second half of the year the situation will be different and uh, the need to travel for people will emerge. Well, one more question I asked. What about our citizens in Belarus? Well, the number of Lithuanian citizens is very small. We have the Lithuanian community. These are mostly Belarusian citizens, but of Lithuanian origin. We are very much concerned and we follow. The policies of Belarus towards uh, our Polish neighbors when Polish uh, schools are being closed, when uh, Polish representatives are being put in prison with the investigations carried out. Well, I cannot say that uh, the situation is similar with uh, Lithuanian origin citizen, but the situation is very complicated overall. But people are used to that. The situation in Belarus, and this was uh, mentioned today, that uh, this situation has uh, been for a long time like this. And uh, this uh, existence in the authoritarian regime was uh, taken for granted by many people in Belarus as a way of survival, a method of survival. This is something that is usual for people. Thank you, Your Excellency Ambassador. And now I would like to give the floor to our last speaker, Anatol Lebetka. She is a representative of uh, the opposition against Lukashenko. He has been raising uh, confrontations with the Belarusian authorities. He has been arrested for several times uh, for uh, uh, participating in different protests and rallies. He was uh, um, for several times uh, uh, accused of uh, provocations against smear campaigns against Lukashenko. You saw the entire process, you've been following the process for so many years. How has the situation changed? The civic society, as I've already been mentioned, has uh, reinforced, has become stronger. People are intimidated, but they have courage to go to the streets. So the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Labetsko. Microfonas. Please switch on your microphone. Good morning. I thank my friends, my, the organizers of this important event. I also have some relation to the topic of journalism. Sometimes I become a blogger. And in the morning today, I released um, a program that is dedicated uh, to the uh, killing of uh, Yuri Zakharenko. The problem of uh, human rights and violations of human rights uh, occurred not last year, but uh, much earlier. And I think that if uh, in 1999 we Belarusians and the international the community uh, had been more resolute, against Lukashenko's uh, revolution, he wouldn't be allowed to strengthen and reinforce his regime 
and to make it a challenge not only for a million of millions of Belarusians, but also to our neighbors and the entire international community. Therefore, we have to admit our own mistakes too. Yes, in 2000, I was a rather young politician. My opposition activities in the beginning of the 90s began. Over this time, we faced ma we had many scenarios. Well, I basically agree with the four scenarios that were um, proposed by Mr. Adomenas. But an important question, what is uh, the level of uh, possibility of one or another scenario? It depends on many factors and uh, objectives and tasks uh, of uh, major political actors is actually a determining factor. Another factor is the economic situation. Which side will um, the economy take? This is a decisive factor because there, there have always been a group of people who are reacting by their stomach and this is the electorate, the voters in Belarus. And the third factor, the major factor, where will the Belarusian issue be raised in, in the international community? And therefore, the coalition between Washington and Brussels is needed now, because this might, might be a very important factor that could uh, determine one of the four scenarios. Kremlin is also a factor because uh, Mr. Putin can also be a, a backing force for Mr. Lukashenko. When we speak about sanctions, this is a possible instrument against possibly the Russian Federation, the Kremlin and Putin. But they could be also used by Putin to support the illegitimate ruler of Belarus. This support of the toxic Lukashenko could weaken Kremlin's position. Speaking about the civic society, yes, we are witnessing of an opening of the entire nation, of all the people. I'm impressed. I've never imagined that this could happen. And what happened? And one word changed, actually. For a very long time, I had been welcomed by my compatriots asking one question. When you do something with the regime of Lukashenko, and last year I joined my compatriots who would tell me, we are really a force. And you can see the difference because uh, previously people would say you and now they started saying we. This change from you to we is a good development when people no longer expect for some kind of external power to come from Vilnius, Warsaw or Berlin to help them do something. People understood that they have to take responsibility for what is happening in our on our soil I would like to voice several of my ideas in relation to what should be done we should yes support the society they are very these are very important 
с помощью наших литовских друзей, with the help of our Lithuanian partners, in national parliaments, we should establish provisional groups, parliamentary groups in different parliaments for the democratic Belarus. And, and we have Mr. Pavilonis, who is responsible for such group in the Seimas. Um, and uh, all these uh, groups could uh, form the umbrella organization, umbrella community, and they could be responsible and supportive of journalists, media representatives. Well, the worst thing is when people uh, do not do anything, and even the small effort is meaningful, and I hope that other national parliaments could establish similar parliaments entry or provisional groups for the democratic Belarus. I have an idea of uh, holding the marathon of solidarity with Belarusian bloggers and I would like to invite uh, famous bloggers from different countries, Lithuania, Ukraine, Russia, Poland, in order to make their voice heard in Belarus. So if we have uh, Lithuanian bloggers uh, who are ready to take part in this marathon of uh, solidarity, you are welcome, please inform me, and I think that this will be a very good event, an effective event that can be implemented. And finally, in terms of scenarios, what is happening now in Belarus, we see deprofessionalization of the system of government, especially the force block. We have been noticing that the Belarusian policies are described by generals, military generals, who received their titles in the recent years, and they received them for repressions and suppressing demonstrations, and this is a selection already. These are not only military people, these are some kind of ideological successes of uh, people who worked in a concentration camps. We had a general called Karpenkov, uh, who made a political statement or manifesto of uh, the current authorities, and he urged um, and invited to uh, react to each protester as to bin Laden. But I'm happy that the support of such generals to Lukashenko is very unnoticeable. And finalizing on the optimistic note, we have a fantastic situation. We have a leader that was voted for by many people. And in recent uh, months, Lukashenko hasn't uh, offered any idea to change uh, the balance of powers. Yes, we remind, our situation in Belarus reminds the partisan war. And Mr. Lukashenko said that yes, he would uh, hold uh, the re-election, the presidential re-election, but he said that, well, the condition is that Biden should do the same in his country. I think that the fourth scenario that has been mentioned is our scenario, is the scenario of the future of Belarus, and I'm completely convinced that we will manage to attain that. Thank you. Thank you, Anatoly, for this uh, 
kuris vis dėl to scenarijus realiausias, bet jūs jie sako, kad savo bėgėjai nužodėjai, kad to, kad tikite įstengti, ir jūsų daug optimizmo ir kad visi kartu ir kai naisim. Ir ką jūs tiesiai pasakėte, kai išgyja įvirsta į mes, keičiasi dalykai. Tai ačiū labai jūs, Thank you very už jūsų kovą, už jūsų Thank you for optimizmą, your struggle, jūsų for your optimism, motivaciją, for your motivation to be ir būti in Belarus, ir būti to be brave, to be a Belarusian who is brave and who inspires others to struggle and to fight. I thank all the speakers. It has been a wonderful discussion and I will give the floor to Danius. Thank you, Daila. Thank you, all the participants, all the speakers. I can tell you from my own experience that every situation has alternatives, but the most realistic one is the situation about where we live, how we plan to proceed. So, Petras Ustrevich, this is one of the organizers, initiators of our today's forum. Maybe some concluding remarks, if you can. Thank you, Danius. On behalf of all the organizers, I would like to thank all the participants who have found time and who presented uh, very interesting insights. I am convinced that the targeted audience found it extremely useful, even though the message was not always optimistic or calming, we do understand what's going on and why it is going on. I can just remind you that back in the 19th century, we needed two uprisings in order to put the basis for the liberation of our nations in the beginning of the 20th century, 21st century. I don't know how many conferences we will still need to see a free and democratic Belarusian nation that will decide how to live, what leaders to elect. But I believe that each word we are pronouncing is not empty because we do think and we have been discussing it with Danius Razavichus quite recently that during the processes which started on the 9th of August, Belarus raised Vitis, the national emblem figure, so high as we have never raised it ourselves before. Our brothers Belarusians, who are also uh, offsprings of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, cherishing the historical memory is also quite important. A few more things. One of the practical decisions, what we seek to achieve in the European Parliament, now uh, perceiving that the fight may be quite long, we need to have two parallel ways. One, not to refuse our sanctions, while talking to the regime, be principled and not go into any compromise that may turn our efforts to nothing. But on the other hand, we need to offer comprehensive support to the white public, Belarusian people. And one of our proposals is to reduce the prices, reduce the visa fee for Belarusians, having in mind uh, what is the average salary in Belarus. What we have done so far is insufficient. I believe this can be easily implemented and it wouldn't be very expensive for the European Union, really. This is the step we need to, to make. We need to send a positive signal to Belarusian people on a continuous basis. 
Second, when seeking changes in Belarus, it is my wish that Belarusian people and everyone does not get tired and disillusioned. I believe that our, after our common efforts and victory, we will still need to take care of the necessary reforms. And this may require a lot of efforts. Next, since we have important dates related to the restoration of our press and our speech. I would like to say that the journalists, the bloggers, who are experiencing persecution and all the pressure, who are being detained, have to understand that future streets will have Na will be named after them someday. This will be the fact that we will be proud of. And let me just assure you that your deeds and what you are doing today, being bloggers, being journalists, is extremely significant. While being on your side, let me assure you that the future generations will properly appreciate what you are doing. However, speaking about the scenarios, we have to choose the scenario which will be most favorable to Belarusian nation. And let us not be frightened by the East, because the East has only one scenario, to abolish the independence and subjugate the country to the interests of Kremlin. I thank you once again for the organizers of this conference. It was very, it was a great pleasure to work with you. Thank you, Patras. I uh, have to say one important thing. I remember going and crossing uh, Lithuania. Patras Ustravičius headed a very important committee or office. It should have been called the ministry, I guess, and he continues his efforts till this day. Europe is, as our home is expanding constantly, and before giving the floor to Dala, we should not uh, forget uh, that uh, it's Friday, and we should keep it that in mind. Thank you, Daniel. Well, while listening to Svetlana Tsikhanovska, I was uh, actually uh, shocked by the names she named. Of, very often we forget about people in the country. We consider the country to be a territory, but actually a country means people, live human beings who breathe, who have families who plan their future, and uh, I would like to address our people in Lithuania. We should not think that this is something very distant, that uh, it has nothing to do with us, because we have many uh, our own problems. The nuclear power plant in Astraviac is several, uh, several uh, dozen kilometers of uh, Lithuania. People who are being tortured, who are assaulted, are close to our borders. This is something about us. Uh, we should be reminded that this is the regime that we uh, lived in. We should not take freedom for granted, because uh, freedom is something uh, for which people sacrifice uh, their lives on the other side of the border. So I invite all Lithuanian people to support those who come to Lithuania to support journalists 
And I actually um, recommend you holding a marathon of solidarity. This would be something small, but something meaningful. I believe that you will agree with me that the Committee on Foreign Affairs uh, on February called on the Belarusian regime to release all the arbitrarily detained people and uh, organize free and fair elections. I want to thank Mr. Pavilonis here in the Seimas who actually invites us to uh, join this patronage group. We have uh, three members of parliament of Lithuania who took patronage over people Viktorovic Militnyi, Nilsen, Pavilonis, Tomis, Vytautas Ratskevičius, Matyos Šaitis, Monika Šmenskis, Nikolai 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 Šmenskis, Nik